Hi, welcome to our live Facebook feed today at the Sydney Opera House. Stay with us today for Bridge Climb at 10.30, Toronto Zoo at 11 o'clock, Sydney Luna Park at 11.30, and Royal Botanic Gardens at 12 o'clock. My name is Paul. I will be your guide for the Sydney Opera House today. And folks, uh, the tour that you're joining isn't just any tour. It's a very special tour. Just today, we're talking about the history of the Indigenous peoples in this area. The very proud Gadigal people who are still here today. Now, folks, the Gadigal were hunter-gatherers, so their lifestyles very much depended on their ecosystem. Sydney didn't always have a harbour. Many thousands of years ago, this was a river valley. As a result, they were very much uh, land-based. They, they took advantage of the land animals, the vegetation. But after Sydney had become a harbour, they became harbour-faring people. They would take to the harbour on their canoes, which they called Nawi, and spend hours of their days out in the harbour. The fishermen of the Gadigal were not fishermen at all. It was the women of the tribe who were responsible for it. They would paddle out onto the harbour in the Nawi in uh, groups and sing with each other to keep their paddling in time. Uh, spending hours out there, they would actually fight, light fires on their Nawi, their canoes, inside, not only to keep themselves warm in winter, but to actually prepare food while they were out on the harbour. The Gadigal people folks, as their lifestyles changed, uh, they began practising uh, different things. One of the practice, practices they uh, took up was the construction of midden sites. What these were, were essentially mounds several metres long, uh, some several metres high, uh, white mounds of waste, waste products left over from fishing, more or less. Now, now while it may sound like uh, uh, essentially a tip, was actually much more complicated than that. It was a very important tool of resource management. Now, the Sydney Opera House sales folks today very much resemble huge midden sites. And in fact, there were midden sites here uh, when the British had gotten here uh, almost 200 years ago. Now, if you were a family going into a particular area, what you would do is one of the first things you would do is go to a midden site, dig to the very bottom of that mound of the midden site. Whatever resource was at the bottom has had the most time to replenish itself. Whatever resources at the top has had the uh, least amount of time to replenish itself and thus would be left alone. Folks, it was a, a very important tool of resource management. The Gadigal, uh, for many thousands of years, have been very conscious of uh, using the resources sustainably in this area. Of course, with the arrival of the British, the Gadigal's way of life did change. Uh, the, the, the change in their lifestyles can be very much summed up and embodied in the history of one man in particular. He wasn't uh, actually a Gadigal man. He was a man uh, from the, the Wungal people, uh, from the southern banks of the Parramatta River in Western Sydney. Now his name was Wulawari, but we today know him as Wulawari Benelong. I'm gonna take us to our Southern Forum at our concert hall. We'll speak about uh, Wulawari Benelong in great detail and his history and life. Just this way, thanks. Now, folks, to understand uh, Benelong and how he came to interact with the British uh, leaders here, we first have to understand the British position. Uh, by the early 1790s, they became pretty desperate for food. They had a grand idea of coming to Australia with seeds uh, and basically planting those to take advantage of crops. But after a few years, uh, things became pretty desperate. Australia's a very different climate to what they were used to in Great Britain, and as a result, what they brought with them didn't actually take to the, hut, to the, to the soil. So, uh, they became pretty desperate for food. Le uh, Arthur Philp, the leader of the British expedition, sent out his men uh, in boats onto the harbour here. Now, the goal was to get the information. They wanted to take advantage of the resources here, the vegetation, animals. They just didn't quite know how to do that. They didn't know what was poisonous or was safe to eat. They didn't know the habits of the animals, which were nocturnal and whatnot. Uh, and as a result, uh, they wanted to get that information. They captured a bunch of local people. Now, one of the men captured was Wulawari, uh, Benelong, but it was by complete chance. He was by the area one day, uh, just down by the water, with his mate Colby. A bunch of soldiers came up in a boat, presented to them a huge catch of fish, uh, seemingly handing it out to them. Of course, enticed, they went closer to the boat. Once close enough, 
they were thrown in chains, uh, taken cap captive. Now, Colaby escaped almost immediately, but Benelong would remain a captive of the British for many months. During that time, he was taught the English language, and after that, he was basically a mediator and a translator between the local people here and the British. But it didn't happen immediately. Uh, he escaped after a few months. He, was, uh, he feigned illness, and once the, the shackles were removed from him by his uh, captors, he disappeared into the Sydney bush line. He ran into the bush, and he wasn't seen for uh, many months. Now, when he was finally heard from again, he was extending an offer for a meeting. He wanted to meet Arthur Phillip over at Manly, just beside us here. Now, the purpose of the meeting, unbeknownst to Arthur Phillip, was actually payback. Uh, with tribal law at the time, uh, if somebody were wronged, uh, the person that was wronged was owed a spearing. As soon as Arthur Phillip stepped off the boat, he was speared in the shoulder as payback for capturing Bellum. Now, after that, you might think the, the relations between the local people and the British soured, but uh, because uh, Benelon had his payback, uh, relations were pretty positive after that. So much so that Benelon was taken to Great Britain to meet the king, one of the first indigenous peoples to leave this land and one of the first to meet royalty. I'd like to take us down to our northern foyer, that concert hall, where we'll speak about Benelon's life after returning from Great Britain. Now, folks, uh, after Benelong had returned from Great Britain, um, where his wife sadly died in transit, she, she also went with him, but sadly passed away in transit, he returned to Sydney Harbour here. And what he returned to was greatly different to what he had left. Uh, the culture in the area, the, the, the life of the Indigenous people had changed dramatically. Uh, the, the people weren't out on the, the Naui, in the harbour. They weren't out singing, fishing or paddling. Uh, they had all receded uh, into Western Sydney. Uh, out by the Parramatta River, uh, leaving uh, this part of Sydney to the British, essentially. The midden sites that were at this point here, uh, Benelong Point, were actually uh, basically taken down and used as resources for the first foundations of Sydney's first buildings. Uh, not only that, uh, the, the shack that Benelong had here, that acted as a, a mediating place, a bit of a, a meeting place between the local people and the British, had also been taken down. Uh, and uh, many years later, this will become a fort on this land. And Benelong, folks, after he got back to this area, he'd seen that life here was completely different. So rather than stay in this area, he took up an offer of a friend of his. He befriended a man by the name of James Squire, a recently freed man, who extended an invitation to Benelong to, to basically go out to his property and uh, live there, uh, basically offering him sanctuary. Uh, Benelong was taken out to James Squire's property, all 800 acres of it, uh, took hundreds of his people out there, and that's where he spent the remainder of his days. And uh, that's where he is buried today, uh, sadly passed away in 1813, uh, buried out in the property, uh, and is today commemorated, commemorated by a plaque that was placed there by his friend, James Squire. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, the history of our Indigenous peoples in this area doesn't stop there. Today, we are very proud to host the Bangara Dance Company at the Sydney Opera House. Uh, they specialise in Indigenous Australian performances. Uh, next year in 2018, during the, the mid-year season, they will be hosting a show here at the Sydney Opera House called Dark Emu. Now, it very much embodies what we spoke, we spoke about earlier in the tour, about how the relations between the local people and their ecosystem was paramount importance. This uh, show really helps highlight that. Uh, it's directed by Stephen Page and what it does is uh, basically explains the life force that imbues the, the, imbues the animals and the, the vegetation here. They uh, explain that through song and dance and that's what Bangara will be doing next year. would highly re recommend checking that out if you get the chance. Uh, Bridge Climbing is going live uh, next. Join their Facebook page at 10.30. Uh, stay with us until then. Thanks very much for joining by today folks.